Welcome everybody. We are going to do another block of poems from the Characters and Relationships module. This is for English 1102. Uh, we're going to do a block of four poems. It is After Making Love We Hear Footsteps by Galway Cannell. Litany by Billy Collins. Love Poem with Toast by Miller Williams. And Once in a While I Gave Up by Sharon Olds. And the four poems, these four poems together show some different perspectives of relationships, the ways people, the ways people interact with each other uh, in relationships and friendships. And sometimes in the case of Once in a While I Gave Up after they are over. So we're going to just jump into those. I'm also going to try to cover any terminology as we see it, as it comes up in the poems. Um, we're going to start with maybe the most famous of these poems, uh, and also the sh maybe the shortest of them. Uh, After Making Love, We Hear Footsteps by Galway Cannell. You see Galway Cannell, um, famous Irish-American writer, passed away in 2014 there. Um, this is by far and away his most famous poem, although if you look him up, he's got... He's got some, he's a relatively well-known writer. This is a short poem. It is about, it's really important, I think, in the title. After is in the title. This is not a poem about a child walking in on his parents, having an intimate moment. They're done. He comes in afterwards. Um, For I can snore like a bullhorn, play loud music, sit up talking with any reasonably sober Irishman. And Fergus, that's the son's name, the child's name, Fergus will only seek deeper into his dreamless sleep, which goes by all in one flash. But let there be that heavy breathing, or a stifle come cry anywhere in the house, and he will wrench himself awake and make for it on the run. And so what you get in this first section, all the way down to on the run, is the dad saying, I can, you know, I can make all this noise. I could be snoring loudly, or playing music, or sitting up talking with my friends. And their son would just sleep right through it. He, he just only sink deeper into sleep. He just heavy sleep, sleep right through it. Um, but let the parents start having this intimate moment. Let them start getting together, and he's going to wake right up and come see them, come see what's going on. Um, he will wrench himself awake and make for it on the run. You can see right here, too, we've talked several times about sejuras, which are hard stops in the middle of the poem. Uh, a long M dash like that, that's going to be a sejura, a hard stop in the middle of the poem. If you're interested in enjambments, too, the whole first few lines of this poem, like a bullhorn or play loud music, reasonably sober Irishman, and Fergus will only sink deeper into it. You don't, you don't get a pause in the first lines of this poem until this fifth line. So this is um, one, two, three, four long enjambments in a row if you're looking for those. Um, and then, as now, we lie together after making love. So the parents are just laying together, happy, being with each other. Quiet, touching along the links of our bodies, familiar touch of the long married. That always seems like an important moment in this poem. This, these people have been married a long time. They're just happy to be together. They've been together long enough to have this child. And he appears, another says, you're in his baseball pajamas, it happens. The neck opening so small he has to screw them on. It's always a great image in this poem. Because if you've ever been around children, seen them grow, they often, they don't wear out clothes, they outgrow their clothes. You know, their ne the neck of their pajamas will get too small for them, so they have to sort of pull it on, screw it on over their head. You get this nice image of, the, of this small, growing little boy. Flops down between us and hugs us and snuggles himself to sleep, so he jumps in bed between the parents, goes back to sleep. His face gleaming with satisfaction at being this very child. And we finally get an end stop line at the end of the stanza. And then the second stanza of the poem. In the half darkness, we look at each other and smile. So you got the mom and dad, they're smiling. They're not upset that he's come and got in bed with them. They're happy. Touch arms across this little startlingly muscled body. This one whom habit of memory propels to the ground of his making. Just if you, that's a tough line to understand for some people, but the, the little boy comes back to the place where he was made, the place where he got started, to the people that made him. Sleeper, only the mortal sounds can sing awake. This blessing love gives again into our arms. 
And so you get this double blessing where making him and the, the mom being pregnant with him was a blessing. And then him coming and jumping in bed with him and all three of them snuggling together is the double blessing, the blessing that they get again um, with him jumping in between them. And so you have this, on a basic level, you have this happy little poem where these people do the thing that made their son and then the son comes and jumps in bed with them. So they get this double happiness simple little poem about two people that have been together for a while and their little boy. And then this is a little bit more complicated, a little bit of a tougher poem. Um, this is a poem called Love Poem with Toast by Miller Williams. Uh, Miller, Miller Williams, relatively famous poet. Um, he is, he has passed away now, but if you know the singer Lucinda Williams, she is his daughter. Um, this is, there's a somewhat complicated device in this poem that it takes a second to figure out, and the poem finally reveals it to you. Some of what we do, we do to make things happen. The alarm to wake us up, the coffee to perk, the car to start. So some of the things we do in life, we do to cause things to happen, to cause effects. You know, you, you set the alarm. You start the coffee, so it'll make some coffee. You turn, the, you turn the ignition in the car, you start the car. Some of the things we do, we do to make things start. The rest of what we do, we do trying to keep something from doing something. So some of the things we do in life, we do to prevent things, to stop things, to halt things. We try to keep our skin from aging, the, the hoe from rusting, so trying to prevent tools from rusting, the truth from getting out, so trying to keep secrets, stop stuff from getting out. Yes and no, like the poles of a battery. And this is the central idea, the central image of this poem, that some of the things we do are positive to make things happen. Some of the things we do are negative, like the negative poles of a battery to keep things from happening. And that that is what drives life, is that flow of the poles of a battery, the positive and the negative. Powering, that's what powers, like the batter, power from a battery, powering our passage through the days, we move as we call it forward, wanting to be wanted, the positive. Wanting not to lose the rainforest, the negative. Wanting the water to boil, making something happen. Wanting not to have cancer, preventing something from happening. Wanting to be home by dark, something we want and are trying to make happen. Wanting not to run out of gas, prevention. As each of us wants the other, watching at the end, as both want not to leave the other alone. And so it turns into this happy relationship poem at the end because you get the sense that the two people in the relationship, they are like the poles of a battery. They are the positive and the negative. They work together to make things happen. As both want not to leave the other alone, as wanting to love beyond this meat and bone, for the love, the energy, the power to go on past this life. We gaze across breakfast and pretend, pretend that things are gonna go on forever, that, that neither of us is gonna pass away and leave each other alone, that we are gonna keep living together and, and not prevent each other, prevent ourselves from losing each other, prevent ourselves from losing our relationship. It's a simple poem once you get the yes and no like the poles of a battery because you need both the positive and negative flow and charge of a battery to make it work, to power things. And then you have Litany by Billy Collins. Um, I, there's a video on YouTube of Billy Collins reading this poem, so we will let him read it. Um, and then uh, we'll try to follow along with him, and then I'll come back and talk about some of the important moments in it. Here he is talking about it. If this will play for us. Let's see, here we go. Well, it's this love poem in a magazine, and uh, it's a series of uh, comparisons in which uh, the poet um, relies on a very uh, ancient um, device in, in, in Western love poetry. Uh, at least dating back to the Middle Ages, which is to compare the beloved to various things in the world, and therefore, by flattering her, so your eyes are like stars and whatnot, you um, you make headway. And um, the um, so he uh, his poem really is a wheel spinning exercise in these kinds of comparisons. About 40 lines of just the same stuff. You're like, you know, this, you or this and that. So he begins by saying to the uh, beloved, um, he says, You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. 
litany. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. You are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. You are the white apron of the baker and the marsh birds suddenly in flight. However, you are not the wind in the orchard, the plums on the counter, or the house of cards. And you are certainly not the pine-scented air. There is no way you are the pine-scented air. It is possible that you are the fish under the bridge, maybe even the pigeon on the general's head, but you are not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk. And a quick look in the mirror will show that you are neither the boots in the corner nor the boat asleep in its boathouse. It might interest you to know speaking of the plentiful imagery of the world, that I am the sound of rain on the roof. I also happen to be the shooting star, the evening paper blowing down an alley, and the basket of chestnuts on the kitchen table. I am also the moon in the trees, and the blind woman's teacup. But don't worry, I am not the bread and the knife. You are still the bread and the knife. You will always be the bread and the knife. Not to mention the crystal goblet and somehow the wine. All right. Now, it's important to understand here that one of the things that is happening in this poem, if you don't understand the title of this poem, a litany, is, as they tell you right here, a series of petitions or repetitions or a, te a tedious recital or a repetitive series. So what it really is is a list or a repeated list of items or things or something like that. And so what this poem is and what it becomes and what he is making fun of as he explains at the beginning of the poem before he starts reading the poem is this is a love poem making fun of all of the images that people use in love poems, the way that people repeat all these things. And in fact, he decides to make fun of this particular image, you are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblin and the wine. He decides to make fun of that because it doesn't make any sense. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you have a cup full of water, I don't have a crystal goblet or wine right here, but you can't be the cup and the water. You can't be the container and the thing contained. Just like you can't be the bread and the knife. Um, you can't be the food and the thing that cuts the food. And so these images, these metaphors, don't make any sense. Because a person can't be everything. And that is what this poem is about, is you can't be everything. You can't have it all. So you get this first stanza that he read where he, he uses all this imagery to describe this woman. She's so beautiful. She's, she's the white apron of the baker. You know, birds taken off and fly. However, you are not the wind in the orchard, as he says. And so he gives you this. You can't have all the, all the nice images. You can't have all the pleasant, happy images of the world here. Um, you are certainly not the pine-scented air. It is, and then he says, it is possible you're the fish under the bridge, but you are not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk. He's saying, look, you're wonderful, you're great, you're beautiful, but, but you're not everything, you're not all of it. And a quick look in the mirror will show that you are neither the boots in the corner nor the boat of sleep in his boathouse. Again, it's, it's this, what you're not. But that really leads him to the line that is important to understanding this poem, speaking of the plentiful imagery of the world. That's what this poem is really about, is the plentiful imagery of the world and all the images that we can use to describe people and compare people to and talk about how beautiful they are, the imagery of the world. And then he says, I also happen to be the shooting star. So he's saying, you're wonderful, you're great, you get a lot of images, um, but I am, I am some things too. I'm, I'm pretty good myself. I'm also the moon in the trees, the blind woman's teacup, but don't worry. 
I'm not the bread and the knife. You're still the bread and the knife. You'll always be the bread and the knife. So the poem comes full circle here finally at the end, and you get this. He circles back to the image that he started from, and it's like, yeah, even though it doesn't make any sense, you are pretty wonderful. You are pretty amazing. So you are not to mention the crystal goblet, and somehow, even though it doesn't make any sense, the wine too. So you get this love poem sort of making fun of the plentiful imagery of love poems and how the imagery of love poems just somehow does, just sometimes doesn't make sense. Now, speaking of happy love poems, the last one that's in this block of poetry and that I want to talk about is Once in a While I Gave Up by Sharon Olds. This poem is tricky because it is buried in a bunch of this medical language and iliofemoral and ischiofemoral and pelvis and words of socket and femur and words like that. On a basic level, what this poem is about is she tells you in the first few lines, once in a while I gave up and let myself remember how much I liked the way my ex's hips were set. What this poem is really about is liking this person like remembering and liking the way that their ex, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend's hips looked and her thinking about how, how nice a shape they had. The head of, and that's where all this medical language comes in because she's basically trying to describe or understand why it was so memorable and why she can't, you know, even now she still every once in a while thinks about it. The head of the femur, which rode, not shallow, not deep, in the socket of the pelvis. And it's almost like you're reading a medical textbook. Wrapped in the iliofemoral and the ischiofemoral ligaments. Again, the things that hold, that hold your um, hips together and that let your legs move. The ball bearing suspended just so to give him that walk. Wooden yokes in grade school foreign country custom movies had moved like that over opulent zinc, bu- zinc buckets of milk. And she's thinking about other things that sort of move like this and had this motion. The motion was authentic. It was from another place. It was planetary. Model of the solar system. She's thinking of those models of the solar systems and things sort of like rotating. I idolized it without reserve, caution, or limit. I loved it with unprotected joy. She's just thinking about how much one of the best things about being with this person, dating this person, was watching them walk and walking with them. Months or a year later, I still dreamed it sometimes. The illusion of a constellation visible only from the Earth's vantage, the glittering peaks of his iliac crest. We're back to medical language here. Um, if you don't know what the iliac crest is, it is the pointy, the two little pointy parts on the tops of your hips. A is to be up, as B is to see across, as C is to D down. Bright winchings biting. I even let my right hand describe the curve of that posterior. So she's even thinking like this is, you know, thinking about the shape of it. Cool, 30-year long nights give us, now set. Stubborn, fundament, stubborn fundamentalist conviction. My hand described the mortal crescent. And so she is thinking about... Even though this person, they're broken up, they're not together anymore, she's thinking about the things that, the thing that she liked best about them. Um, the thing that, um, even now, she, every once in a while she gives up and let, lets herself think, man, so-and-so was so good looking. This person, my ex, was so good looking. It's a simple little poem about remembering how somebody looked nice in this very particular way. What you get in the combination of these poems you get you take love poem with toast and after making love we hear footsteps two poems about people being together for a long time this affection of people who have known each other and been in a relationship for a long time versus litany and once in a while i gave up which are both poems these sort of sillier poems about little uh moments or memories or images of of the people that you've been in relationships with or something like that. So you take them all together, you get two kind of serious poems and two kind of silly, funny poems. Uh, If you have questions about any of those uh, or any of the ideas in them, uh, be in touch with me over email, Zoom, whatever is easiest for you. And uh, as I said, this belongs in, these four poems belong in the Characters and Relationships module in D2L. And if you have questions, be in touch. Uh, Thank you all for your time, and I will see you next time.